Ever wonder how therapists and supervisors make sense of the complex, messy human experiences their clients and supervisees bring to therapy and to supervision? It's not just intuition or relying on what they already know. Instead, a major component in the sense-making is what is called inductive reasoning, a process we use every day, often without even knowing it. In today's video, we'll explore how this powerful mode of thought shapes psychotherapy and supervision, helping therapists make sense of new and often incomplete information. Inductive thinking helps us navigate uncertainty by piecing together clues from incomplete information to form a hypothesis. It's like assembling a puzzle without all the pieces. Each new piece helps refine the picture. When you're faced with ambiguity, whether in daily life or therapy, inductive reasoning helps you move forward even when you don't have all the answers. And here's the thing, in therapy, inductive thinking isn't just a cognitive tool, it's the compass therapists use to navigate complex emotional landscapes and tailor treatment to individual clients. Donald J. Meyer highlights something often overlooked in supervision. The cognitive style and methods of thinking used by both the supervisor and the supervisee. He points out that much attention in supervision has been paid to the clinical material under discussion, to transference, counter-transference, the parallel process, and at times the supervisee's unconscious process. Less attention has been paid to the cognitive style and methods of thinking employed by trainees and supervisors in the work of learning and teaching. This is significant. When we think about learning to be a therapist or guiding a trainee in supervision, we often focus on clinical content and technique. But Meyer suggests that how we think how we process new information and integrate it is just as important as what we know. And one key aspect of the how we think is inductive reasoning. So, what is inductive reasoning? Simply put, it's the process of drawing inferences from specific instances to form broader generalizations. Unlike deductive reasoning, where conclusions follow with certainty from given premises, inductive reasoning works in the realm of probability. It's about making educated guesses based on patterns and then refining those guesses as more data comes in. For example, let's consider a 19-year-old client who smokes marijuana daily, walks away from treatment frequently, and reports that her boundaries are often violated and that this is why she is hesitant about opening up. My experience with similar cases suggests that intensive uncovering therapy may not be suitable. Instead, I recommended a more supportive approach focused on creating corrective emotional experiences. How did I arrive at this conclusion? I considered her substance use, her communications about boundary violations, and general developmental insights about teenagers, all while factoring in her anxiety manifestations. Now, contrast this with another patient in their 30s who has no history of substance use and displays high emotional capacity and strong internal conflict. This person is eager to work through their emotional barriers, so I recommended an intensive form of therapy. My decision was grounded in inductive reasoning, taking patient dynamics, past knowledge, and anxiety analysis to form the best treatment plan. In the therapeutic setting, 
both the therapist and the supervisor are constantly using inductive reasoning to make sense of the patient's material. Meyer emphasizes that both therapists and supervisors employ cognitive, emotional, and experiential capacities to process this material. And a key part of this is induction, drawing insights from incomplete or ambiguous data to guide interventions. Meyer explains that relating the material the patient presents to known or newly created categories is the bread and butter of supervision. Therapists and supervisors continuously organize patient data into larger frameworks, like clinical models, hypotheses, and theories about human behavior. When we apply these frameworks to what the patient presents, we're using domain-specific knowledge. For example, a patient's behavior around session cancellations or paying fees might seem like a logistical detail, but in therapy, these behaviors often reveal crucial information about the patient's feelings toward the therapy or the therapist. Once you recognize this, it changes the way you listen. You become attuned to these subtler cues, and your inductive reasoning helps you make sense of the deeper dynamics at play. But here's where it gets tricky. Inductive reasoning is not without potential problems. As Meyer notes, induction is, of course, risky. In making inferences, one must take into account the variability that exists in the world and that might render conclusions invalid. Think of noticing your clothes are fitting tighter and the scale showing a higher number. You might infer that you've gained weight, but maybe your clothes shrank or the scale is off. Similarly, in psychotherapy, we must be careful about the conclusions we draw from our observations and test them against further data. Meyer also asks, can inductive reasoning be taught or is it an inherent skill for good therapists? He suggests that inductive thinking can in fact be cultivated. It involves listening to the patient, gathering impressions, organizing those impressions into manageable ideas, and then matching those ideas with known patterns of human behavior. This process is central to forming hypotheses, testing them, and refining our understanding of the patient. In supervision, this process becomes a collaboration. Meyer notes that the development of meaningful associations is a dialectic between supervisor and supervisee. The latter may think of patterns and categories that have not occurred to the supervisor and vice versa. Supervision isn't just about passing down knowledge. It's about engaging in mutual discovery, where both parties contribute their own insights and perspectives. However, inductive reasoning has its challenges. Therapists may rush to conclusions without enough data, mistaking early impressions for solid inferences. Others may hesitate to form hypotheses at all, fearing they'll be wrong. Meyer writes that at the heart of the trainee's rush to interpretation is often a fear of not knowing. Supervisors play a crucial role here modeling curiosity and demonstrating how to suspend judgment while gathering more data. This creates a space where uncertainty and exploration can coexist. Inductive reasoning is more than just a cognitive skill. It's an essential part of the therapeutic process. It allows us to take incomplete or ambiguous information and create meaningful, actionable hypotheses. As Meyer reminds us, all therapists need to reason, associate, 
be creative and be self-reflective to do their work well. Restrictions on any of these ways of thinking will limit therapeutic competence. At the end of the day, therapy isn't just about applying pre-existing knowledge. It's about engaging in a dynamic process of discovery. Whether we're working to understand a patient more deeply or refining our own ways of thinking, inductive reasoning is what helps us navigate the uncertainties we face in clinical practice and supervision. And learning to use it well is a crucial step in becoming not just a competent therapist, but a reflective and adaptive one. So next time you're in a therapy session or a supervisory dialogue, remember, it's not just about what you know. It's about how you think. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content on psychotherapy, supervision, and the thinking processes that guide our work.